Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. Uh, Thursday morning. Um, we are we are recording while the uh, Trump trial is going on. So forgive us if we're not completely uh, up to speed on uh, what's happening there. But you know, we Two have trials. To- What's There's that? the hush money trial and the oh, Supreme, Supreme Court, Court arguments, right? Right. The immunity arguments. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, so we might have something to say on those things, but we can't be as as cutting edge as we would like. People come to us, uh, I think, for wisdom, Bill. They they don't come for like the <laughs> latest what what is happening two seconds ago. They want us to put it in. They want us to explain it. They want us to put it in context. That is exactly what we're going to do, Bill. And I want to start with some things you've been writing this week. Okay. Um, and let me give you a little a little credit. You don't always get things right. Like I, I think you were a little you were a little too bullish on Mike Pence's chances of being the Republican <laughs> nominee. But I think you got uh, you got something else right, and that is that Ukraine would get the funding. I was I think I was probably skeptical in this environment with uh, MAGA really turning against Ukraine, turning toward Russia, that the funding would ever come. And it happened. I think some praise certainly belongs to uh, Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. Mm -hmm. You were right. You always thought that it eventually would happen. So kudos again Mm -hmm. on that. Um, But it seems like Joe Biden, there was this, um, I don't know if it was a, a sign on his desk or just a saying that Reagan had, but it was something to the effect of, there's no telling how much you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. And it strikes me that Joe Biden keeps mm-hmm. rolling up W's, <laughs> but he doesn't get any credit for it. And I think maybe this is one more example of that. Well, I think he definitely deserves some credit, as as, as does Johnson. And like, I, I was a little overly bullish on the border bill compromise, um, although that was partly because I felt you know Ukraine aid was really. Uh, a must have that uh, folks at Washington were going to find a way to get one way or the other. And if the Republicans were saying, well, you have to do something on the border to get it, then they would do that. Um, what proved to be more accurate is uh, immigration is so, uh, hatred of immigration is so central to the Trump era Republican Party that to expect a middle ground there is is too much to ask. But But it wasn't uh, really a middle ground. Republicans got uh, mostly what they say they want out of it. And look, I think that's maybe an underrated part of this story is that we just passed this Ukraine funding bill and we could have done it with a, with border <laughs> security being a part and, of it. And I, it's, and a, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a missed opportunity for the country and for Republicans. They ended I, up taking the medicine without it, the mashed potatoes or, or whatever the analogy would be. And I can't obviously definitively prove it, but I do think there are better odds of getting that border bill if McCarthy was there and not Johnson. Uh, McCarthy and Cinema had a very close relationship. Uh, and, uh, I, I, and I think if McCarthy was saved, he would have been saved without the votes of any Freedom Caucus people or the hardest right of the Freedom Caucus. And so I think his, his latitude would have been different. Yeah. Um, one, th- but- one thing we, one thing we, and I, I, I hate to keep doing the interruptions and digressions, but there's interesting points. I haven't heard anybody, um, anybody else make, or at least not hit home. Is it, I didn't realize the personal, excuse me, the personal animosity that Kevin McCarthy had uh, within his chamber. I mean, Kevin McCarthy is effectively, you could argue that he's better than Mike Johnson from a MAGA standpoint, you know, Um, not much daylight between Kevin McCarthy and Mike Johnson in terms of how they're behaving as speaker. But the anim, just people hated Kevin McCarthy in a way that I didn't fully appreciate personally. Well, I think, I I don't, I don't know, I don't think I'd say McCarthy is more MAGA than Johnson. I think they're, they're both essentially operating the same way. There's not all that much difference in how they're functioning. Uh, Johnson is proving that he is going to do the bare minimum to keep government functional. He's not a burn it down nihilist the way the Matt Gateses and the Bob Goods and the Chip Roy's might might want to do. Um, but uh, and I don't know if, if Johnson was there first and McCarthy was second, maybe everyone would hate Mike Johnson more than yeah. than, than they, uh, the, the the tables would, would have been turned. 
I think there's a degree of exhaustion um, with the whole drama, which is helping Johnson. And Democrats really put Ukraine aid at the absolute top of the list of what had to get done. Now that, I mean, before it was the getting the, avoiding a debt limit breach. That was, you know, essential. Uh, and, you know, if McCarthy was allowed to hang around long enough to do the Ukraine aid, which I think he would have done, Democrats might have offered him the same kind of backing, uh, but they didn't trust him to get to that point. Uh, Johnson was the guy they got. Uh, and he, at the end, of the, even though it took a long time, longer than it should have, uh, he came through. And so they're they're tipping their cap. Yeah, no, I, I think that's 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 fair. Um, OK, so back to Biden, though. Yeah. Um, Joe Biden is getting stuff done partly by staying out of the way. He's not trying. I mean, if, if, well, if it's, it was it's more, it's more than just that, I think that I don't, I don't, well, I don't think it's being well, totally passive. Let me say, no, I, he's he's working behind the scenes. I, I think it's a strategic move. And I've had I had two different imp, sort of important Republicans tell me in the last couple of weeks that uh, if it wasn't for if Joe Biden wasn't president, they'd all be for supporting Ukraine. But this is seen as Biden's war. OK, well, that's first of all, that's silly. That's childish, in my opinion, that you would oppose something because you're not. The other party has the president at, at a given moment. But I believe it's true, as childish as it is. And if Biden had been seen as as taking the lead on this, I think it would have been it would have poisoned the well. Right. Yeah. So I and, think that and Biden, Obama was the same way in a lot of other things, too, that he didn't get credit for. He, he often hung back. So uh, a sensitive issue would not be seen as a win or loss for him. Yeah. And that would allow Republicans to 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 come over. Um, uh, I think Biden handled it the same way here. And, and just, just to get back to to the McCarthy parallel, you know, uh, part of the reason Democrats, you know, dumped him was a lack of trust. He's just like the rest of them. I, I don't care that he kept the government open on in the stopgap. I can't. He's trying to undo the debt limit deal. I can't trust him anything. So I'm not going to bend over backwards for him. Uh, and there are a lot of Democrats from the very beginning of the Biden presidency, which lumped all Republicans in the same bucket. They're all, they're all terrible. You can't, there's no point trying to do anything bipartisan with them. They're going to stab you in the back. It's Lucy in the football, all that kind of stuff. If Biden went into the Ukraine issue thinking, Mike Johnson, this guy, he voted against Ukraine aid. He's so tight with Trump. Trump is, is in with Russia. What's the point? There's no point in trying here. There's no point in trying and failing. It's going to make me look bad. So I guess Ukraine is lost. And so we're just going to try to pin it on Johnson. And that would have obviously been, uh, in, in, as a literal sense, self-defeating. You would not have even tried to get, to get the job done. Uh, Biden said, OK, we think we can convince Johnson. And I, and I said this very early on, by the way. I, I didn't say that with a... With a, with a high confidence, but that it's possible that everyone in the national security establishment might go to Mike Johnson and say, hey, if you're, if you're the guy that prevents Ukraine aid from coming, because the Senate's for it, you're going to own Putin taking Ukraine and possibly beyond. That's going to be your legacy. Uh, and Clear and so what the Biden Biden did was you know they had their own intelligence briefings of course, but they also leaned on the pro Ukraine Republicans in the House. They can you guys talk to Johnson? You know I need I, I we got we got a double team this year. You know, we're going to do our intelligence briefings. Biden's going to have some one on one, but we need you to really communicate this too to say this this is serious business. This isn't no screwing around. Uh, and I think the combination of all that clearly worked. You know Johnson his most recent comments is all in on stopping Putin. He's all in on accepting the intelligence uh, and uh, was able to at least, you know, throw Trump a bone and say, we made a, we made a loan. It's a loan, not a grant. Yeah. Uh, which of course might get forgiven down the line, but that was enough yeah. to keep Trump at bay for now. So I think, I think yeah. the Biden strategy was uh, uh, optimistic. It was savvy. Uh, if, if he succumbed to cynicism and rank partisanship, we wouldn't have been here. 
I agree. I also think Mike Johnson is, um, I don't want to be let down by this guy, but I, I think he, I mean, I think he, he seems like he's an honest broker, um, that he's going to negotiate. And, and he, by the way, he's, he's apologized to Joe Biden for rolling his eyes at the State of the Union. I think that's a positive step. Um, this is someone who I think Donald Trump likes. Now, Trump kind of has to like him because it's such a narrow Republican majority in the House that there's not room for a lot of shenanigans right now. But um, but I think that there is a personal relationship uh, between the two. I don't know if you read uh, Elena. Um, oh, I can't think of her. Last. Plot. Elena Plot. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't her, her get piece. past the paywall. Okay. Um, but there was All a right. section I chose where... to not get past the paywall by paying. There's a uh, normally you're good at defeating the paywalls, Bill. You normally figure out a workaround. No, the the Atlantic is tough. <laughs> well, if you would like to gift Bill an Atlantic, paywall. <laughs> no, but uh, there was a part that got tweeted out where Mike Johnson, one of his sons, almost drowned at Palm Beach. Uh, seems like it was about. I, a month I did ago. see that excerpt get, get shared. Yeah, and Trump called him up and they talked, and uh, Trump was like, "That that's a God thing," and then. I mean, there's a part in there I don't like where Mike Johnson says like something to the effect of just like your presidency is Providence, sir. You know, um, but I do think that there is a per that, that that Donald Trump personally likes Mike Johnson for reasons I don't fully understand, which, by the way, is vital. If Trump had tried to sink this deal, he probably could have. OK, even though I think Mike Johnson acted heroically, even though. Joe Biden, I think, acted shrewdly and appropriately. If Donald Trump had gone full on, tried to, to torpedo this Ukraine funding deal, I suspect he could have. He did not do that. So Mike Johnson somehow has got Donald Trump liking him, let, giving him a, a leeway to do some good things. And uh, I, it just it strikes me that Mike Johnson, I think he's a devout Christian, Reaganite kind of guy. You, if you're a liberal, secular liberal, you're not going to like his social positions very much. But um, I think he's someone that can keep his word. And, and that's important if you're negotiating, that at least you you may not agree with the other person. But if, if they're not lying to you, that's important. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a narrative that somehow Johnson is more honest and likable than McCarthy. And and I, I don't I can't honestly can't speak knowledge. I haven't had personal interactions with either one of them. But, you know, Johnson's not a total saint here. There are definitely things he, you know, he, he flip flopped on the border. He insisted on legislative changes, then pretended that he didn't. Um, he, you know, rammed through the bill to keep the government open without adhering to the 72 hour rule. You know, so he's, 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 he's cut, he's cut corners here too. Yeah. So I just I, think I, we're so, I think we're so starved for, especially on the right, we are so starved for someone who has honor and integrity and is, is going to be a profile in courage that what Johnson did and in, in making this happen, um, you know, it, 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 you shouldn't get credit for doing what you ought to be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but because of the context mm -hmm. of, of we're used to Republicans being so bad that uh, it is very refreshing, I shall say. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's without any integrity. I mean, but, uh, uh, I just, uh, I, I, I think that I just think it's overstating the case a bit because he is he, he's being a politician too. He's not, yeah. uh, and but he clearly recognized that there was something that was more important than rank partisanship in protecting Ukraine, and he does. And I think he does deserve credit for that, even though it took him longer than it should have, because um, uh, there's genuine there was genuine risk involved, you know, uh, uh, and. Does this mean that Trump doesn't really care about Ukraine funding and would let this go if he was president? That I would not uh, say. Uh, I I don't know exactly what's going on there, but clearly he has gotten the message that it's not a good idea for him to be in an open feud with the House Speaker between now and Election Day. We know that Donald Trump is quite willing to have attack other Republicans. He still attacks Mitch McConnell. Um, so, uh, uh, so why he feels the way towards Johnson, I can't say exactly, but yeah. there's there's definitely a vibe there that they don't want that to be they don't they don't want a total breakdown in party unity 
uh, between now and Election Day. It just reading that Atlanta plot excerpt, it, it feels like there is a connection that Johnson and Trump have that like, I don't know if See, that, that, that's why I don't really believe. I think Trump can turn on Johnson in a flash. Uh, Trump can drop loyalties without, you know, in between bites of food. So I, I, I would not I, I'm skeptical of thinking that there's something that's truly unbreakable there. Well, let's get back to the main theme of, of this uh, part of the discussion, which is your point about Joe Biden. I mean, um, I think he was very shrewd at handling Ukraine. Um, I, I think it takes now. part of it may be that Joe Biden is old and he doesn't have <laughs> enough energy to, to, to claim credit and drive a narrative. But to the degree that this is uh, strategic, I think it, it it's effective and it, it demonstrates humility. Well, I, think, I, know, think, and I admire that. I think. Democrats are doing a bad job of giving Biden credit. Uh, and I don't, it, it's, it's, it's easier said than done. I mean, look, mind you, this, you know, the Ukraine vote was Saturday. The day before, Israel backed off of doing a broader military assault on Iran and left it to a very minimalist counterstrike designed to avoid escalation. And that was literally following a phone call between Joe Biden and Bibi Netanyahu. They were, they were going to a bigger strike. I mean, it wasn't just the phone call, but according to the New York Times, that was saying three uh, uh, other officials, uh, not like people in Biden's inner, inner circle, but, but Israeli officials, um, saying uh, Biden spoke to Netanyahu, now you, now you got that phone call, and changed his mind on the, on the counter strike. Uh, so uh, there's been a lot of frustration that Biden hasn't had, you know, un, uh, infinite leverage with Netanyahu in terms of uh, the Gaza response, uh, but does argue there was value in maintaining that relationship strained as it may be. So Biden could still pick up that phone and have that conversation and, and prevent World War III. So I, mean, I think both these things are World War III preventers. You're preventing I, Russia from going, taking Ukraine and going beyond. You're preventing Israel and Iran from completely uh, spiraling out of control. Uh, and it's because Biden has a philosophy of leadership, which involves maintaining personal relationships with people, even when you don't agree with them. Uh, and I think Democrats could be uh, saying this a whole lot louder. But to be fair, there is a lot going on. There is the Trump trial. There are the campus protests. Uh, 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 so, uh, and there, there's the Mike Johnson story about Ukraine, which is interesting in and of itself. So it is hard to sort of break into all that and, and tell this narrative. But I do think if the shoe was on the other foot and this was a Republican president, you'd have a flood of Republicans praising Trump in the skies. Oh, this is the most glorious president we've ever had. Can you believe the magical things that he's accomplished? You know, we, we're not seeing as much of that on, on, the, on the Democratic side. I do admire the philosophy of keeping relationships and not try getting out over your skis and trying to claim credit for things the whole time. I do admire that. I will say, Bill, um, I think, look, I don't know what Netanyahu was planning or considering. It would have, if, if Israel was planning to take out Iran, if they were capable, if they had the ability and they were planning to take out Iran's nuclear capacity and Biden stopped them. I think it's probably, probably a mistake that could lead to World War III. Um, but otherwise, I hear your point, and I think Biden uh, is, so you, is underrated. You would have rathered a bigger strike on Iran? If Israel had the capacity well, to so, completely so, 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 take so, out on. Iran's nuclear program. Well, that I don't this know. Was, this was a great... They had been handed a great excuse to do just that by Iran. I I would imagine they would not have been able to, in a day, take out all of Iran's nuclear program. I'm sure a lot of it is hidden away underground, all that kind of stuff. I, I'm not the expert here, but I imagine it's not that simple. I'm not an expert either, and you're probably right. But that's my caveat. Okay, let's move on to the uh, the other Big, well, there's several big issues, right? Mm -hmm. One of the other big issues, and that is uh, Columbia University and the, I would say, anti-Semitic protests taking place there and encampments. 
what is your take, Bill? Uh, I think you know where I stand on this. Well, I wrote about this. I should say I wrote about the whole buy, getting giving Biden credit. I wrote about that for the Washington Monthly Newsletter on Tuesday. So, so check out that piece. That newsletter is great. I'm not just saying this. I love that newsletter. Oh, thank I, you. Uh, it's if you like Bill's what Bill's you know his, his Bill's philosophy, <laughs> you know it's. It, it's le- it's shorter than a column, right? It's usually like maybe five hundred words. Yeah, I I'm try guessing. I try to keep it tight. Um, and then you know you've got like links to other things happening interspersed, yeah. but it, it's it's great. So keep Thank up you. the good work, man. Thank you. Uh, and my my fuller column at the Washington Monthly today is about the divestment uh, encampments at Columbia and elsewhere, uh, and I, I, it really speaks to the question of is this even an effective tactic to be pushing? You know, you're you're disrupting all these college camp college campus activities uh, for what exactly? Uh, the, the the main ask is for the college university endowments to divest from entities that are tied to are tied to the Israeli military. Uh, in some cases, they talk about the, all ties to Israel. Period. They even talk about ending academic relationships with Israel Israeli research. But it depends on what what college protest you're talking about. Um, uh, and here's the main problem with divestment. When you have an asset and you're divesting it, you're selling it to somebody else. So someone still owns the asset. It's not you haven't deprived Israel or whoever you're if this was you know tobacco or climate or whatever, you're not depriving your target of the the money involved. Because someone you're 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 handing it to somebody else. Uh yeah, so but you're saying no blood on our hands. Well, that's Which I think there's a moral kit. Look, you know, I'm pro Israel, but I think depending on what you're divesting from, there is a moral case that's like, look, this is going to exist, but we don't need to be a part of it. Well, okay, if it's but that's a very uh, like it's a literal matter, a, sort of a selfish act. I don't, I don't want to be complicit. You can, you can be complicit. It can still go on. I don't care if it. If, whether it stops or not, but at least my hands are clean. I mean, that I is a know. very. Look, I, I don't want tax. I don't want my taxpayer dollars going to pay for abortions. Um, I would prefer that we lived in a country that was broadly pro-life, but at the very least, I don't want to be you know, complicit in it if it's going to happen. So that, that seems so to me if, to be if, irrational. If, I, if my belief is that, that the death and suffering amongst Palestinians has to stop, but my main act is to make sure that I'm not, my, I'm not personally paying for it. Like when that person go to Gaza and saying, Hey, I know that you're still starving, but not on my dime. Yeah. Thumbs up. No, but I, I look, that may be their main ask, but I bet you, 99.9% of the people who are the people who are aware of the protests are unaware that that is the ask. And so I think the real well, that, point that's, the that's pro- a whole other, whole other element to this, but go, but go on. Well, I was going to say, though, I think the, the whole point of the protest is to call attention to Gaza and the plight of the Palestinians and to change public opinion against Israel and for, we'll say, Hamas. Or we could say the Palestinians, but I think that's the real point of it. Well, yeah, and 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 you 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 can look at you know most divestment strategies have not worked. The one that you could say did is with South Africa uh, apartheid in the eighties, but that was not a divestment only strategy. There was a whole lot of other. I mean, there's active activity going on for years before divestment really kind of accelerated in the in the mid eighties. Uh, and it culminates in a sanctions bill, you know, much broader than divestment, coming out of the U.S. Congress that overrides Reagan's veto. And so you could say, look, divestment strategies on college campuses have PR value because things that ha- when there's student uprisings on college campuses, journalists who went to those colleges see it as being really important. And lots of media consumers see what's going on on college campuses as important, they, either because they think, oh, this show, th- this is 
great important change happening from our youth or oh my god our the nation's youth are turning to radicals is everything's falling apart but they care about the stories and they read them and they get attention uh and so that can then uh amplify uh a broader message to uh and rally public opinion globally against your target. Uh, now, in the case of South African apartheid, there's just absolutely no justification for apartheid. It's a straightforward racial oppression. There are you know, English Dutch settlers who are minority of the country, uh, having all the power and subjugating the uh, South African uh, black majority. Uh, and, I, and I quoted Jesse Helms, who was against uh, the sanctions bill. Like even Jesse, Jesse Helms is like straight up racist, you know, <laughs> he's like the worst. Uh, and uh, even he says there, you know, uh, no one wants apartheid. Like he he couldn't even argue it was a good for government. He's like, it's just not our business. Uh, the African National Congress, they're communists. We don't want to have Soviet domination of Africa. Like he had to go there. But like. That none of that really justifies apartheid, and therefore, and so the arguments that didn't fly. Uh, so you an issue of a relatively small country that perhaps otherwise be ignored by the global population. You were able to shine a light on and and really magnify the moral, the the, the immoral nature of what was going on there. In the case of uh, Israel and Palestine. This is a much more complicated story because both peoples have ancestral claims to the land. Both peoples have been victims of horrific violence and bigotry. Uh, so when you, so on one sense, these campus protests have attracted a lot of media attention. Uh, so in, in that narrow sense, these are successful. But in this case, when you draw media attention to this story, you don't simplify it. Because it's inherently complicated. Uh, and guess what? Because this is sort of a loose-knit band of people running the show here, you're attracting people who are saying overtly anti-Semitic things, uh, who, are, who are not talking about peace, talking about violence, so to, talking about burning down Tel Aviv. Uh, now, that is it fair to attribute that to everybody who's protesting? I don't know, because I barely, because the people organizing it are so loose-knit. There's no control over who's really running the show here. Uh, and that's all, all I mean, as far as the effectiveness of the tactic, you are not simplifying it and clarifying good guy, bad guy here, because inherently the situation is not that clear. Uh, and so it's not a good it, it's not a good uh, situation for a divestment tactic to have a great effect. Uh, so that so to your point with the PR, they're getting more PR, but to what end? All right. I'm sure we'll. Hopefully we won't be talking about this story next week, but we might. <laughs> um, I guess we should probably end with a little bit about the Trump trial. Uh, I'm talking about the hush money case in New York. Bill, I played this clip on my uh, Matt Lewis Can't Lose podcast uh, earlier this week and on the YouTube channel. Um, but I want to play it again and get your response. This is Fox News' Jesse Waters complaining about the treatment of Donald Trump and, and how uh, bad, it, how hard it is for an old man to have to sit and, and stay awake through uh, this trial. Uh, here we go. Former president of the United States, if he leaves court to go to the restroom, jail. If he calls the prosecutor corrupt, jail. If Trump moves or says anything, they scream, jail. Did Khalid Sheikh Mohammed get slapped with a gag order? Trump's not even allowed to complain about the thermostat. It's a meat locker in there. He gets mocked for just closing his eyes. Donald Trump, been on the move his whole life. Golf, rallies, movement, action, sunlight, fresh air, freedom. This isn't lawfare, it's torture. They're making a 77-year-old man sit inside a dingy room for eight hours straight, four days a week. And if he moves or talks, jail. How do you campaign for president if you can't move or talk? I should be in Georgia now. I should be in Florida now. I should be in a lot of different places right now campaigning, and I'm sitting here. So I'm Jesse speechless. Waters hates us like this kind of uh, torture chamber. Uh, 
I, I see it as Night Court. I think it's like this is literally Night Court. Like they should do an SNL sketch where you, you have a Dan Fielding, you have a Harry Stone. Because the, the nature of the case is a Night Court episode. Everything about this, the <laughs> setting, the substance, uh, it's, that's what it all is. Uh, so, and, and look, it's just, Donald Trump is not, a, not below the law or above the law. Uh, he has to sit there because that's the rules of when you get accused of, of a crime and you're, you, you have to go to criminal court and, and, and deal with that. And you have to live by the judge's rules. That is how court works. And Donald Trump, you know, he, he, he has other, uh, he can go, well, he, he can do something at night. He can have a nighttime rally. He can get on a plane and go to, I mean, if he wants to go to Georgia and have a 9 PM rally, go for it. Uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps he doesn't have the energy to do it because he's so sleepy and Gordon that he can't he can't add to his schedule. Um, but he brought this on himself uh, by if you want to, I can't say he's he's going to be found guilty, but obviously he danced very close to the line, uh, and that's why he's in the situation that he's in. So suck it up, kid. Yeah. And what about like the judge has to be there in this horrible environment? The jury. Uh, the jury have to be there, witnesses, and Trump has violated the gag order. He's gone, he's attacked witnesses, he's retweeted or retruthed people like Jesse Waters going after jurors or potential jurors. Um, and a lot of people, like my dad was a prison guard for 30 years. He voluntarily went to jail for three decades so I could get paid to talk about Did politics. Did you complain about the thermostat? <laughs> well, he didn't have control over it. I mean, <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of people who work hard jobs, um, and maybe they prefer to be on the golf course too, but you got to do what you got to do. I mean, so. how many people have had their lives negatively affected by Trump's behavior, who've had their freedoms curtailed in some way, have had burdens put upon them because of what he, I mean, I'm not talking about like people who oppose Trump, people who are with Trump. How many people now have to go get hauled in the court in Arizona because they were they were trying to uh, you know carry Trump's water? Um, Trump has put so many people in horrible situations uh, by putting himself first at all times. And Jesse Waters, who gets to uh, have a, what a seven figure salary in a very cushy uh, TV studio, <laughs> not have to work very hard. Uh, and so we can all try to people feel sad about Trump's predicament. I mean, think about all the other people who had to have their lives upended because of what Trump has done. All right. We'll end on total agreement, Bill. Uh, great show. Short show. Good show. Well, I, let, let, before we I, wrap, wrap it up, do you think that as this trial proceeds, that it is having any impact on the election outcome? Well, I'm glad you asked that, Bill. To answer that question, I'm going to go to my good friend, Harry Enten from CNN. If I can get it to work. If I can get it to work. Hang on. I thought you were going to see Harry T. Stone, which would have been awesome. Are you seeing no. In polling <laughs> since the Republican primary ended and the focus has shifted into the courtroom. Yeah, I think there's this idea that the legal troubles that Trump is facing have somehow helped him. But that's not something that I've necessarily seen in the recent data. So this is Biden versus Trump margin nationally. Look, in January and February, you had a pretty clear Trump lead, right? Plus five, plus four, plus five. And you had the Marist poll that had Biden up by one, but within the margin of error, a Trump lead. Look at what's happened in April, though. All of these polls, all of them have shifted to be more friendly to Biden. Plus four, plus three, plus one, but it was plus four Trump back in January and February, and plus five to now plus two. So something is cooking, Kate. Something is cooking in the polls. And whatever is cooking seems to be helping Joe Biden. And one of the things that might be cooking is the fact that the attention has turned from the Republican primary now to Trump's legal problems, because that's really been the ma main thing that's been in the news. Something is cooking. It sounds nefarious when it comes from Harry Enten. Is, Monsa, there, a yeah. <laughs> is there any sign, though, that you're seeing of what we it has been suggested, Donald Trump has said it, that this attention, his legal troubles are helping him. Yeah, so let's take a look here. This is the Biden versus Trump margin by attention paid to Trump's legal cases. This is from a recent New York Times Siena College poll. If you're spending, if you're putting some attention, some or a lot of attention, if you're looking at the Trump trials, look at this. Biden leads among these voters by eight points. If you're paying little to no attention, Trump leads among these voters by 18 points. So the more people are focusing in on the Trump cases, they're actually more likely to vote for Joe Biden than for Donald Trump. The less attention that you're paying, the more likely you are to vote for Donald Trump. Anyway, there has been, I think, <laughs> a uh, 
Bloomberg poll since then that was bad for Biden. Those are those are state based but, polls, not national polls. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm not I don't think they're that great from what I can what I can discern. Well, it's, it's hard because we poll the states less frequently. And I don't know how well we can judge the quality of that polling. Um, and not, not every national poll is a high quality poll. There's, there's just a lot more of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think the national polling is better at assessing trend lines. Uh, although obviously it's possible for Biden to be up by a point or two nationally and still lose the bulk of the swing of the swing states. Um, now, uh, so, but I, I want to circle back to that point. But first, I want to say that we have seen movement towards Biden nationally. In fact, I think I'm just looking at the real clear politics average. I think we've gone from about uh, two plus uh, Trump lead in like February, March, and now it's 0 0.3 in the average. Um, so you know, it's a massive swing, but some movement. And But it's hard to know, is that Trump trial? Is that State of the Union address? Uh, is that uh, abortion? You know, we we can't separate separate out these factors easily. Um, so I... I yeah. And, and, and maybe the trial is part of it, but I just can't know that for, for a certainty. Uh, the part at the very end that Harry was talking yeah. about, about who, are you following things the trial closely? I mean, you might be following it closely if you're a Trumper, but you wouldn't tell a pollster that because you want to be grumpy about it. So I just don't know if that is all that much value. Well, plus uh, in that, it's that being number. talked about more on MSNBC because Fox is covering the unrest on college campuses. Right. And well, Jesse Wars is talking about it. I know that. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's a, they're going to they're gonna talk about it here and there because they want to play victim, but they want Trump to be the victim. But I think that Fox is focused a lot more on the college campus unrest, whereas MSNBC is wall-to-wall -wall Trump trial. Sure. Uh, and CNN is pretty heavily Trump trial, but I'm, seeing, I'm hearing things about the campus stuff there, uh, there too. Um, when I look at the polling, the state polling, uh, Biden is uh, much more competitive as, as, the, as it stands in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin than he is in Sunbelt, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, Florida. Uh, and his narrowest path to victory is Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Nebraska, was it Nebraska two? Um, if they can keep that system in place uh, in Nebraska, like that gets you to two seventy. That literally, that, that's literally two seventy. Uh, so, uh, and we just don't know yet. Yeah, you know, those Bloomberg polls, which were generally bad for Biden, he was up to in Michigan. This is the place where people thought he was going to get hammered because of what's going on in Gaza and the and the Arab communities there, and that was his best state in the Bloomberg polling. Uh, so. There's still a path to victory here, even if you're taking these state polls uh, at, at face value. Um, but I still think the operative question is, can Biden get a bigger head of steam nationally that will change the dynamic in even the Sun Belt states? That, I think, is an open question. I mean, there's, there's, there's so much game left to play here. All right. And on that, that note, uh, make sure to read Bill's stuff in Washington Monthly and sign up for the newsletter. Uh, make sure to read my piece about why the left should stand up against anti-Semitism as it pertains to these college uh, protests. Uh, support us at Patreon, patreon.com slash BillShare, patreon.com slash Matt Lewis. Follow us on Twitter at DMZ Show. Bill, anything else to plug? Uh, that's it for me. All right. Well, we'll see you all back here in the DMZ next week. Take care.